Well, good evening, everybody. It's uh, 7 o'clock on a Thursday night, so it's time for our Facebook Live Bible Study. Uh, I hated to have to not have the class last week, but there just wasn't a, a better time. We had church council exactly at 7 o'clock last Thursday night, and uh, there were things going on all around it, so I just couldn't move it to a different time. It always hurts whenever you have to cancel for a session uh, because it's, uh, it's hard to get people back for the next session. I see two people are on, so hopefully we'll, we'll have some more join us as we go along. Um, we have a couple things going on at church, as we always do. Vacation Bible School is underway this week. And uh, from all accounts that I've heard, everything's going really, really well. The set design this year, the setup in the commons, the, the, uh, the gym, and all around were just awesome. So um, it looked like it would be a lot of fun. I'm having to guess at what it was going to be like because I couldn't be there for Vacation Bible School. Oh, Lynn says it's gone really well. Um, Becky and I and Nathan and a bunch of people were at annual conference. And here's Becky on with me tonight. She's going to be reading again. Uh, she had a tough uh, part of the week because she's the stage manager at annual conference. Here's uh, how many people come to annual conference, Becky? 1,600. 1,600. So it's a, it's a, a huge uh assembly hall with 1,600 people in it, <clears throat> and Becky's kind of the stage manager. She's, she's time sitting, keeper. Time keeper. She's trying to keep us on schedule and, and, uh, manage the staff. Becky says manage the staff. We got sound and AV. It's, it's a little bit like at church except, uh, on steroids, and it goes from 8.30 in the morning until, oh my goodness, 9, 9.30 in the evening, and then you get to set up for the next day. I was kind of her roadie. I helped to do some of the of the setup, but it, it was a good week. It was a good conference, and uh, lay leader. Uh, Becky, yes, Becky is the conference lay leader. So in addition to being the stage manager, she had to give a lay address, a speech. The bishop gives a speech, and then the lay leader gives a speech. Becky did that. She uh, uh, gave a report for a committee that she chairs. So it was a really busy week for her. And, uh, but it, it was also a good week. We, we were able to get through conference and uh, nothing really earth shattering happened, which when you go to annual conference, <laughs> that's kind of what you're hoping for. All our pastors did get reappointed to Christ Church. Nathan, myself, and Debbie Stokes will be back for another year. Uh, I think for the most part, that's good news. Maybe the part that I'm coming back isn't, but uh, we, we're, uh, we're reappointed. We, we knew that going in. This time, uh, the bishop had put out her list of appointments early, but until that uh, last day of annual conference, things aren't totally final. And so now they're final for the year. Uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago in our last class, uh, thank you, Lynn, I appreciate that. Uh, two weeks ago, we did Matthew, yeah, right, we did Matthew 13 and... Uh, Jesus uh, used parables to teach about the kingdom of heaven. Um, it, it was like, remember, a, a parable is a, a story that has a spiritual truth in it. And sometimes the parables are similes or metaphors. Uh, the ones on the kingdom of heaven are, are those. It'll say, the kingdom of heaven is like, that's a simile, is like yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like a piece, a grain of mustard seed. And... Uh, so, uh, Jesus told another parable that's not a simile. He told the parable of the soils. Uh, what does the parable of the soils teach us? I'll just take a moment here and, and wait for some responses. Uh, the parable of the soils, that, uh, that might teach us a number of different things. Oftentimes when we hear that parable of the soils, we think of ourselves as, okay, what kind of soil am I? right now in this season of my life. Uh, remember, the parable is uh, some, of the, some of the soil is, is, uh, is thin. Some of it, uh, you know, no place for roots to go down. Some is, you know, it doesn't uh, be steadfast in your faith. Yes, we sow it good. We sow our seeds and hope some will take it. If you're a teacher, 
or a preacher. This is saying to you, just keep on sowing. You don't have to worry and see the results immediately. Just keep right on sowing. And even if you see that some of it is not having the effect you hoped it would have, don't be discouraged. Keep on sowing. I think that's a key point in that. And also to help us to see, well, what kind of soil am I? I'm, I want to be that deep, rich soil where roots go down and fruit is produced. But sometimes things in life crowd that out or perhaps our faith is not deep enough or, or we're not open to the word. That's like the seed dropped on the hard path. Um, so just keep on sowing seeds. That's a, that's a strong message for us. When he said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, what did Jesus mean by that? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And you stop and think, well, wait a minute, a mustard seed? That is so tiny. A mustard seed would be one of those like, uh, I think lettuce is a really fine seed if I'm remembering my days of gardening. Uh, you don't pick up an individual seed and, and plant it. You just sort of work them through your fingers like that. It's almost like planting table salt. They're so fine. Uh, <clears throat> So why would Jesus say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed? It's a key uh, lesson in that for us. They're tiny, but they grow. We keep on trying. That's right. Small things can turn into something wonderful in the kingdom. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of churches start out. Uh, church of the Resurrection is the largest United Methodist church in America. It started out with a group of, I forgot the exact number, but it was like six or eight people meeting in, the, in, the, in a room in a funeral home. It started out tiny, but now today it's got thousands and thousands of members. They, they have worship services almost throughout the week. And the kingdom of God is like that. It starts out small. When he said the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, well, that spreads through dough. Uh, Yes, we have a little bit of faith, just a thread of faith. It's amazing to see what God can do with that. Thank you. Very good comments. Um, and when he says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, it spreads through dough. Uh, you don't have to make sure that the yeast gets in every molecule of flour. You don't. You put it in, you stir it, you knead it around a little bit, you put it in the refrigerator, you know, and then when you when you go look in the refrigerator, it's all spread. The, the dough has risen. Becky will do that sometimes making rolls and you'll go and look and the, the mixing bowl has the aluminum foil sitting up on the dough has risen above the top of the of the mixing bowl because it's risen so much. Okay, Becky, are you ready to read? Mm -hmm. Tonight we're going to do 14 and 15 and Becky's going to start us out with 1 through 12. At the time Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John. But he was afraid of the people because they considered him a prophet. <clears throat> On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl, who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Remember, Jesus is going to be really 
shocked and saddened by that. John is is his cousin, and uh, and uh, he's the one who had baptized Jesus. So this is terrible news. Jesus is going to draw away whenever he hears about this. Uh, what a brutal, terrible thing to have happened to John um, in that scene uh, where he is, is beheaded. But let's back up just a little bit. It says that Herod was a tetrarch. Can anybody tell me what a tetrarch is? I'll give you a hint uh, while we're kind of waiting for my words to get out there and your comments to get back so I can see them. Uh, a monarch, a monarch is one ruler over a kingdom. And uh, so a tetrarch is going to be something different than that. Uh, let's see if somebody can, can take a shot at that. What is a tetrarch? And while I'm waiting, I'm just going to go ahead and keep yammering on. Here the great died. And he had, uh, <clears throat> okay, one of four. Very good. Yes. It's when a kingdom is divided into four parts and somebody rules each of those four parts. When Herod the Great died, uh, he came up with a plan and the Romans overruled him. Uh, Caesar Augustus stepped in and basically divided up the kingdom into four parts. And, uh, and remember, Palestine is under the rule of the Romans and so they can do that. And so Augustus took Herod's son Archelaus, Herod Archelaus, and gave him uh, Judea and Samaria, which was really half the kingdom. So it's kind of like Archelaus got two-fourths. And then the part that's up in Galilee, uh, that's Herod Antipas and Galilee and Perea, which is just east of the Jordan. And so whenever you hear from here on in Matthew about Herod, the first mention of Herod was Herod the Great, uh, who killed all the babies in, in Bethlehem after the birth of Christ. He's the one the Magi went to. Now, this is his son from this point on, Herod uh, Antipas. And then there was Philip, and he was given the area up north and east from the Golan Heights east and south of Syria. So the day the country of Syria would have been his fourth of the kingdom. So it's kind of like the the kingdom was divided into four parts, but three sons were given the parts. So Herod Antipas had taken his brother Philip's wife. And uh, can you imagine what Thanksgiving lunch would have been like uh, in that household? How awkward. Uh, John had pointed that out. He had told Herod, this is a sin. You're committing adultery. You cannot have your brother's wife. And so John was being faithful, but Herod had him thrown in jail. Uh, now Herod is really superstitious and whenever he hears all the things about Jesus healing and teaching and, and doing the things that Jesus does he decides maybe he's John the Baptist come back to death and, and so Matthew now needs to explain how John died and he, Herod had him put to death because of his wife Herodias requesting that John's head Becky, are you ready to read some more? Yes. Now, this is one of the best-known miracles um, in the Bible. It's 14, verse 13 through 21. And I'll, as she reads it, I want you to tell me about what Jesus was doing when the crowds gathered around him. This huge crowd gathers. Don't tell me what he did after they gathered, but what was he doing as they gathered? Okay, Becky? When Jesus heard what had happened... He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves 
and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Okay, Pat has answered absolutely correctly. She says Jesus had drawn away for a solitary time of prayer and reflection, probably prayer and reflection on, on John the Baptist's death. Absolutely. <clears throat> He's grieving. Uh, I think Jesus probably knows he had compassion, healed them. Yes, he's going to do all of that. But I think he had pulled away to have some time alone. It says he went to a lonely place. Uh, he's praying. He's probably realizing if that happened to John, it just underscores that something similar to that is going to happen to me. Uh, I think realism is kind of sitting in there. He wants some alone time. Absolutely. And I find it interesting that in the middle of his alone, well, actually not in the middle of his alone time, it's almost like just as he gets started, here come the crowds. They see where Jesus has gone, and so they follow him. And instead of him running further away or climbing further up on the mountain, he has compassion, and he does exactly what Brenda says. He heals them. He has compassion on them. He ministers to them. Now, there's a real lesson in that for us. We may be tired. We may be... Uh, grieving, have things going on in our personal lives, but we, we don't ever forget our ministry and the call to serve others. Uh, the crowds found him. Uh, they brought their sick. He healed them. And uh, Jesus says, Matthew says, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Um, let me... Uh, mentioned that people oftentimes, oh yeah, and he saw that they were hungry as well. They hung around for a long, long time. And whenever he saw that, it's like, okay, we need to feed them. He, he had compassion. He realizes they've been out here by themselves all this time. They need to be fed. Um, I think it's the Gospel of Luke where whenever Jesus says, well, let's feed them, one of the apostles says, It'd take a year's salary to feed this crowd. Now, we don't know what a year's salary was then. Today, maybe it would be, I don't know what an average year's salary is, $40,000, $50,000. Think about that. Uh, that's a lot of money. And the apostles didn't say we don't have that kind of money. They just said, think how much this will cost us. It would cost that much. Uh, yeah, Pat just makes a good point here. God is aware of our material needs as well as our spiritual needs. I'm uh, I'm working on a sermon right now called More Than Bread. And that's, that's, that's I'm sort of making that point that God's aware of our material, physical needs. Things like being hungry. But God's also aware of our spiritual needs. And so he, he satisfies needs that, we go, that go beyond bread. That go beyond physical needs. But... Uh, Christ doesn't overlook those physical needs. The Lord's Prayer has in it, give us today our daily bread. So it includes a prayer for those kinds of things. People have tried to explain the feeding of the 5,000 in different ways. Uh, let me ask you, how do you think Jesus fed 5,000? And it's much more than 5,000. That was the number of men. There were no doubt women and children with them. There may have been fifteen or 20,000 people in this huge, huge crowd. <clears throat> so how do you think he did it? There, there are different explanations. Uh, there's the simplest one all the way up to where we sort of have to reach and stretch to get to it. <clears throat> I'll, I'll reach and stretch to one of them and say that some people have made the point that a Jewish person in that time would never, ever leave home without their lunch or their next meal. And they would take uh, dried fish, bread, other things, and put them in a little basket tied around their neck. It was almost like a knapsack, and take that with them. Uh, Dr. William Barclay likes to say that he thinks that's how the feeding of the 5,000 happened, that uh, that. Everybody had food, but nobody was willing to break their food out because they look around and 
But who am I going to share this with? Is my food going to just be gobbled up? But when Jesus started serving others, everybody broke out their food and everybody had more than enough to eat. A lot of people don't like that description because it sounds like it's rationalizing. And Lynn says, as a son of God, he can perform miracles. And that's the simplest explanation that Jesus took those small pieces that we know from another gospel a little boy had and he breaks them and as he gives them out they're multiplied and somehow as a miracle as he breaks that bread as he gives out the fish it just keeps multiplying and there was plenty we know there was there was food left over uh, <clears throat> it wasn't like there it was uh it was scarce i've also heard some people say that it was a a sacramental meal. It wasn't a meal where you ate like Thanksgiving Day and were filled up, that it was something where if you got a little piece of that bread or fish that you somehow were full. But I don't accept that at all because we had 12 baskets full left over. Uh, another way of proving who he was, there's no doubt about it after this, that people flock to him because they see that he can perform a miracle. Whatever happened that day was a miracle. It drew people to him uh, one of the other things that that I learned from this, uh, there's so many of the miracles that we can't explain with physics. You know, we just have to accept it. That we're going to read one about Jesus walking on water. You cannot explain that with physics. That's not the way buoyancy works. We cannot walk on water. Uh, even in the, what is it, Becky, the Dead Sea, where mm -hmm. we went in Israel, you can... You can almost sit in it. <laughs> you are so buoyant. If you lie back, you don't have to lie flat and arch your back like you do in, in fresh water. In that place, you, you'll float. Um, you can't walk on it, but you can, you can really float. Well, here he walks on the Sea of Galilee. Um, what do we learn from this story of the feeding of the 5,000? Actually, Pat's already given us part of that answer, which is God doesn't ignore our physical needs and only give us things that fill our spiritual needs. God cares for us and helps us with with our physical needs. We're hungry. We pray for for food, and, and it's provided. So that's that's one of the things that we can learn. Another is is uh, what Lynn said. The Son of God has He's all powerful. We call that omnipotent, and so of course He can do a miracle. So we learn that. There's something else. There's a couple other things I, I think that we can learn from the feeding of the 5,000. And it's kind of the same point. I might say it a couple of different ways. And I'm going to wait just another minute or two and see if somebody, see if somebody throws this one out. And I, I'll give you a hint on this. It happens whenever he says, uh, so let's, let's feed these people. And the apostles say, but we only have, what did they have, Becky? Five loaves and two fish. How many fish? Two five, fish and five, five loaves. loaves. Five loaves, two fish. Mm -hmm. That's not much. The five loaves, you know, that they're, they're probably, somebody says, one of the gospels says barley loaves. It's a rough grain. It would have been little, uh, you know, little small um, chunks of bread. With God, we have enough. So often we focus on what we don't have. Uh, we, if we share what we have, uh, somebody says, well, then we need to go do so-and-so. And somebody says, but that's not in the budget. Somebody says, we, we can't afford to do that. And what this is teaching us is to think bigger. Think about what we do have. Don't think about what we don't have. The apostles were thinking about how limited their resources are. We only got five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says, bring them here. That's enough. Offer up what we've got. See what God will do with that. It's so often, remember, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It starts with something small and it grows. So many ministries start with something tiny, but then they grow. Uh, Trinity Hope, always think of that. They're feeding thousands and thousands and thousands of children every day. And then it started with 42 children in one school. Uh, now it's like 120 schools, 50-something thousand children, if I'm remembering correctly. It started with 
one school. It's, it's like that grain of mustard seed. Uh, there's an event that happens in chapter 15. If you've got your Bibles in front of you, flip over to that. It's in chapter 15. Let's see where it comes. Uh, there's a huge event. Yeah, it starts at verse 29, ends at 32. And if you're reading through Matthew and you hit uh, verse 29, you say, wait, wait, wait a minute, didn't I just read this? What happens? Chapter 15, that you think, wait a minute, I just read that, didn't I? Lynn is right, and then we say, let's try it. That's, that's right, that's what we're supposed to do. Something new, something that we're not sure we can afford. We're not rash, we don't just jump in without thinking. In fact, Jesus says count the cost before you start a, a project, but we don't let what we don't have keep us from doing it. Um, so what's the event that's going to happen <clears throat> over in chapter 15 that almost looks like a repeat? I can remember uh, thinking at one time that maybe Matthew forgot that he had told something, and now he's telling it again. But I think it's the same kind of thing that happened two different times. What, what is it, somebody? Chapter 15, starting at verse 29. Becky, I bet you've Actually, got it. It starts at 32. The, feed, it, the feeding the 4,000? Yes, yeah. It's, it's, it's verse 32, starting. Yeah. And they feed. They had, uh, it says, enough bread. Um, how many loaves do you have? Seven. They it says they had seven and a few small fish. Okay, so Becky's helping us see some differences. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I think it was a different occasion. What else was different? They, well, the remains, there were seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left. Yeah, and a, a lot of people who've studied this say, okay, keep in mind where Jesus is. He's on the eastern side of the Sea uh, of Galilee and south, and that's Gentile country. Before, he was back up north where it is Jewish country. And other people point out uh, in support of that, or those same people will point out, yeah, when he fed the Jews, there were 12 basketfuls left. Ooh, that sounds like 12 tribes of Israel. Seven for the Gentiles is, uh, seven is the number for complete. Uh, it's like, and this is a remote place, yes. Uh, this time there are 4,000 people, men, who get fed, a different number. So it looks like the same kind of thing happened, a feeding of the masses, but uh, but there were, let's see, I've got another comment. Yeah, there we go. Pat says we see the number 7 and the number 12 a lot in the Bible. And uh, 7 is a number that means complete enough for everybody. 12, 12 tribes of Israel. It's almost like the first story is like, okay, these are Israelites. It's meant for Israelites. Boom, when it goes to uh, down south and east and it's fed to the Gentiles, there's enough left over for everyone. This is Jesus being universal. Jesus teaching for everyone. And you're right, Pat. Those numbers do show up a lot in Scripture. I think it was a completely separate event. This time, Gentiles were being fed. Becky, if you would, pick up now with 22 and read to 33. Another miracle. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a, consider, already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. 
Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those two were in the boat, who were in the boat, worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Okay. Um, this is, as I said earlier, this is one of those miracles, like a lot of his miracles, that you cannot describe, explain with physics. Walking on water, not possible with the natural laws of physics. It, it happened this time. There's a couple of things to notice here. Jesus sent them ahead. The apostles are in the boat. The wind's blowing against them, so they're having trouble uh, getting, uh, getting across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus is praying. He's, he's stayed back. He's, he's fed all these people. Now he needs that time alone. Remember, he went away to get time alone. He's fed thousands of people, and he's gone alone to pray. What do we learn from this story? So you've got the apostles out on the Sea of Galilee. They're really in a storm. Uh, the storm is not something that's threatening their lives, but it's keeping them from making progress. Uh, I don't know if they had a sail. If they did, it's it's not helping them. The wind is actually blowing against the direction they want to go. And uh, if they're rowing, they're having trouble keeping the boat propelled because of the strong current, the strong uh, wind that's blowing in their faces. Becky and I were on the Sea of Galilee two years ago, uh, a little over two years ago, and it actually was coming up a pretty good storm, wasn't it, Becky? Yes. Our whole group was on that, and wind was blowing rain in our faces, and we weren't afraid of sinking, but it was it was not a fun day to be out on the water. Yeah. And it, it kind of gave us a feel of what it would have been like if you'd been the apostles. It came up so quickly. It did. It was just, we were driving along, and the wind was blowing, but it wasn't raining or anything. We get on the boat, and oh my goodness, here comes this, here comes this storm. It did come up very quickly. And even in Bible times, that happened a lot on the Sea of Galilee. Storms could come up really quickly. So uh, Pat says, Nathan showed a clip, and it was a very turbulent sea. That's exactly right. He videoed that uh, with us on that. Uh, it was a nice, large uh, boat, but it was, it was a rough sea. So what do we learn from this story? Uh, we don't learn how to walk on water. You know, that's... That, that's that's not part of, there's no secret to walking on water here. Someone has, uh, I think it was Pat, had said, keep your eyes on Christ. Uh, we're okay as long as we do that. Yeah, when Peter looked down, he saw the rough sea. He, he became afraid and he started to sink. And you notice Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. You know, look at me. Believe, trust. And he would have been okay. Jesus gets back in the boat with him. Uh, there's a couple other things I would point out. Uh, it's kind of like Jesus is praying. He's in his time alone, and yet he sees us in trouble. He sees us in our storm. He knows, he's aware of what happens in our lives. I take a real assurance in knowing that he sees that. He sees our struggles. And uh, yes, Jesus is not focused on the storm. He's focused on on prayer and uh, whenever whenever he sees us in our storm oftentimes he comes without us even asking they didn't ask him to come uh, and, and and whenever he comes he oftentimes calms our storms and always make the, the storm go away but he helps us to get through it we laugh at poor Peter well he tried to walk on water he had little faith and he sunk hey he got out of the boat <laughs> I would have been clinging onto that boat, uh, not not getting out to, to have my faith tested at all. So give it to Peter. He was always one to jump out and, and give it a shot. See what, what he thought his master wanted. 
Um, Becky, if you would, go to chapter 15 now and read verses 1 through 9. Okay. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from that from me is a gift devoted to God. He is not to hear honor his father with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Okay. Um, Matthew tells us that these Pharisees had come out from Jerusalem. Um, the teachers and the Pharisees. And that's a really important point. Jerusalem was their headquarters. And what this is probably saying to us is that the Jewish leaders, people at the temple, have heard about Jesus and now they're sending people out to to spy on him, to find out what he's really about. Uh, these guys have come from headquarters, and they're going to challenge him. The opposition is becoming more formal, it's becoming more organized, and it's becoming more dangerous. I notice how Jesus answers their questions. They say, why do your disciples not wash their hands like the ceremonial law teaches us to do? Pharisees had this thing about if you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat because you could be ceremonially unclean, uh, they would wash their hands seven times during the meal. It was like overdoing it because they didn't believe in grace. They believed that one receives salvation by being totally obedient. And Jesus says, well, you're, you're hypocrites. You, you question me about that, and then look at what you do. And he points out this practice that they had gotten into. There was an Old Testament law that said you could take any part of your money and declare it the Hebrew word was korban, K-O-R-B-A-N. Sometimes you'll see it spelled C-O-R-B-A-N. And it's like saying, this money is hereby dedicated to God. And so what these Pharisees were doing, in that time, there was no Social Security. Older people, when they couldn't work anymore, they depended on their children to support them. And that what the Pharisees were doing was saying, well, the money I would have used to support mother and dad it's now Corban. It's dedicated to God, so sorry, Mom and Dad, you're on your own. And Jesus is saying, how hypocritical. You twist the law to your benefit, and yet you throw the law at, at me. He's, and, and they're not going to be happy with him for pointing this out. Becky, five more verses, if you would. Matthew 15, 10 through 14. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by its root by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Okay. Uh, Jesus has offended the Pharisees in very intentionally. <laughs> but uh, he, he's pushing back on their teachings. He knows they've come to to test him and to try him and and so he's pushing back on them and his apostles are like you realize you've offended those guys they're important they came from jerusalem and jesus basically says what leave them their teachings will will not help you stay away from them 
Um, he, he's pushing back uh, very strongly on the, the, their teachings. Um, leave them. He says they're spiritually blind and those who follow them will fall into a pit. Um, Jesus, uh, Peter went to Jesus and says, what did you mean about what you put into your mouth doesn't make you unclean, but what you comes out of your mouth does? What does that mean? Why did Jesus say that? It's not what you put in your mouth. In other words, washing your hands so that you're not spiritually unclean. Because if you fail to wash your hands, you're, you may be spiritually unclean. For example, you may have touched the clothing of a Gentile, then you'd be unclean. You put that in your mouth, now you're spiritually unclean. And Jesus says, it has nothing to do with whether you're spiritually unclean. It's not what you put in your mouth that makes you spiritually unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth. What does he mean by that? After he had said that, and the Pharisees got it, they knew he was talking about them and their rules, they're offended, but the apostles come and say, would you explain that to us? What did you mean by that? And Jesus says, are you still so dull? <laughs> there are times when Jesus just wanted to give up on them. Uh, they're not getting it. They're not understanding his teachings. We must be like that today. I'm sure Jesus at times says, are you still so dull? You're not, you're not getting what I'm trying to teach. But what does he mean? It's, it's, it's not what you put in your mouth. He explains it kind of in gory detail here. Uh, yes, Brenda. What we say, the way we speak, that's what makes us unclean because Jesus says that's what shows what's in your heart. You eat something that's unclean spiritually, Jesus says you digest it and it comes out of your body. It's done. It doesn't harm you. And he's not talking about uh, physiological clean, hygienic cleaning. This is spiritual. But he says whenever you speak, what comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart. It shows whether you are righteous or or, or clean. Um, that's the real indicator. He left that area of Galilee, went northwest to an area called Sidon and Tyre, and there was a Canaanite woman. Now keep in mind, she's Gentile. She comes to Jesus and says, uh, Lord, would you uh, heal my little daughter? At first, Jesus ignores her, and then she persists. Jesus, would you heal my little girl? And Jesus says, I have come for the children of Israel. It's not right that I should cast their bread to the dogs. Oh, that sounds so cruel. Dr. William Barclay in his commentary points out that there are different words for dogs. And this word is not the cruel, dirty, uh, mangy dog that would be running wild in the streets. This word is for a little puppy who is... Uh, a house dog, a pet. But any way you understand that word, it sounds a little harsh. And the woman kind of, she was so smart in the way she responded. She said, well, but wouldn't it be okay if the crumbs that fall off the table of the children of Israel, you give those to us Gentiles? And Jesus was really impressed with her answer. A lot of crumbs were falling off the tables of the Jewish people. They were they were wasting this good news. A lot of them weren't receiving it. The Pharisees that he just encountered, they weren't receiving it. And she's saying there's a lot of waste going on the floor. Can us Gentiles have some of that? He commented that he was impressed with her faith. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus remarked about her great faith. This is a little bit like the faith of the centurion. Jesus commented on that, and because of her faith, he healed her daughter from a distance. Uh, this is Matthew, and Matthew is, is written for Jews. It's written uh, from a Jewish standpoint. Uh, Luke is written from a Gentile standpoint. But even here in Matthew, Jesus is showing that he came for everyone, including these Gentiles. It shows how universal the good news of Jesus Christ is. While he came focused on the children of Israel, he also loved the Gentiles and was able to, to minister to them. Now next week we'll do Matthew 16 and 17. So please read that and uh, and we'll pick up at 16. We're going to see here the 
the uh, people still demanding a sign after all these miracles, after all the teaching, preaching, miracles by Jesus, they ask him for a sign that he really is the one. So we'll pick up with that, and we'll see you next week. Y'all have a good evening, and I'll uh, and God bless.